In this video, we are talking about prong collars. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, then the goal of this video is to help you decide if you should use a prong collar for your dog. And if you decide to, or if you're watching this in our online training program, then our goal with this video is to show you how to properly introduce it to your dog so you can start using this tool in your training. So the plan for this video, we're gonna cover why we use prong collars, how prong collars work, what brand and what size you should buy, how to get proper fitment, the preconditioning phase and the active conditioning phase. So if you watch this video in full and you complete these steps with your dog, then you'll be able to use this tool in your training. So the very first thing we need to cover is why we use prong collars. Whenever you do anything with your dog or anything in life, you should understand why you're doing it. All right, so let's talk about why we use prong collars in our training system. The video you're watching right now was taken directly from our online training program. If you wanna take your dog from completely untrained to 100% off leash trained, and you want step-by-step -step video lessons just like this on how to get there, and personalized feedback from me along the way, check out our online training program. It's the first link in the description. So if you have watched, I recommend you have already watched the How Dogs Learn and Think module, right? Because that lays a very important foundation. If you've already watched that video, then this graph should look uh, pretty familiar to you. All right. So just very simple here. And on this axis, we have pressure. And on this axis, we have perception. All right. And don't worry, this is gonna, we're gonna keep this simple. All right. So we have pressure and we have perception. Now before I dive into this a little bit and start drawing a bunch of lines. I first wanna talk about why we use pressure in training, right? How is pressure used in training? Well, pressure is used in training to create obligation, all right? Because if you want a 100% reliable dog, you, your training system requires both motivation and obligation, all right? A lot of people like to believe that they can just motivate their dog to listen and if they give them enough hot dogs that they'll always recall and they'll always heal with you and that's just not true okay dogs are creatures of impulse and instinct who have their own desires and their own motivations right it's it's very it'd be very arrogant to think that if you uh trained your dog these behaviors or if you taught them these behaviors and if you gave them a profuse amount of hot dogs that they're going to listen to you all the time, always, right? That'd be a very arrogant belief. In reality, if you want 100% reliability, your training program requires both motivation and obligation. Motivation is when the dog wants to do the thing, they want to work, they want to obtain the reward. Obligation is where the dog understands the concept of must. Right? This is where you have a dog who's in an off-leash heel. There's a, there's a ball that runs right in front of him. There's a dog over there. There's a little kid running around. There's a squirrel that runs right across the street. And the dog stays in the heel because they understand they must. Even though they would like to go chase that squirrel and they would like to go get that ball and they would like to go, they understand that they must heal. Right? And that's different. That's totally different. And so, that's why we use pressure in training, is to create obligation in certain behaviors, okay? And don't worry, you're gonna learn how to do all that throughout the training program, all right? So, let's go back to this graph here. Pressure, what is pressure? Pressure can be many things. It can be environmental pressure, spatial pressure, physical pressure, whatever it is. Pressure is stress, okay? And pressure is objective. Let me explain. If you add this collar on a dog and you are giving a correction, let's say this was your level of correction, that level of pressure is objective. You could measure this, right? You could repeat this. It's objective, all right? Pressure is objective. Now, here's where things get interesting with dogs. The perception of that pressure, of that same pressure, is subjective, depending on the dog, depending on the environment depending on the level of competing motivator, right? It's subjective, all right? So if you were to graph this out, it would look something like this. And there exists a line for every dog. And this line is where the perception of that pressure goes from negative reinforcement to positive punishment. 
all right? And in the training program, as we go through the training, you are going to be teaching behaviors using positive reinforcement, and you're going to be proofing behaviors using negative reinforcement, right? Negative reinforcement is where you teach the dog the concept of must. That's where you have the dog in a heel, off leash, no tools, no rewards, and a squirrel runs right in front of you, and your dog keeps on healing because they understand they must heal, right? That's negative reinforcement. You're gonna be using negative reinforcement in the training to build reliability in the behaviors, okay? Positive punishment. You're gonna be using positive punishment in the training to punish undesirable behaviors. Maybe your dog is barking at other dogs, your dog is lunging at bikers, your dog is chasing cars, your dog is jumping up on the counter, jumping up on people, whatever it is, you're gonna be using positive punishment to punish undesirable behaviors, right? And so this is pressure. This is the perception of pressure, right? This graph is really important and I hope you're staying with me here because I'm gonna explain why. So the reason why I had to lay all this out is because now I can show you how we use this to our advantage in training and why selecting your tools that you use is very important, all right? So since we understand our objective, our objective is to train our dogs to be off leash, obedient, 100% of the time, on leash or off leash, we are gonna require pressure. We're gonna to have to be able to get this, this whole scope with the dog that we have in front of us, right? So, let's break down tool by tools, okay? The reason why you see a lot of trainers use tools like the prong collar, the reason why you've seen trainers use tools like the e-collar is because these tools give you the most leverage. They have the most scope. They have the most range, okay? With a tool like a prong collar, you can apply very, very low levels of negative reinforcement, like, like barely, barely any pressure on there, right? You can get this range. And you can also, at the same time, create extreme levels of pressure, right? So it has a huge range to it. Now, this is also why prong collars get a bad rap a lot of the times, right? It's because people who don't know what they're doing, who don't have a plan, who don't know how to train, who don't know how to communicate with the dog, they get a tool like this, and that's a whole lot of leverage to give to someone who doesn't know what they're doing. It's also why e-collars get a bad rap, right? E-collars, again, have a huge amount of range, and if you don't know what you're doing, you can create some problems for you and your dog, right? So that's why we use prong collars, because they have a huge range. Now, why don't we use some other tools, right? Let's go ahead and list a few. Harnesses, for example, are designed to what? To disperse pressure. It's what they were intended for, right? They're designed to disperse pressure evenly across the body. And so that's why Harnesses, you can provide, you can obviously create very low levels of negative reinforcement, very like annoying types of pressure, but it can only reach to like here, right? You're never going to be able to get to these punishment levels on something like a harness, right? Because it's simply not what the tool was designed for. It was designed to disperse pressure, right? Which makes it a good tool for something else, but not for creating reliability in behaviors, right? So that's that's the, that would be like a harness. Maybe it would come to like here. Maybe something like a flat collar, all right? A flat collar might be a step up from a harness. Maybe you can reach something like, something like here, right? Something like there, right? For a lot of dogs. Now for some dogs, you could absolutely uh, reach positive punishment levels on a flat collar, right? If your dog is very sensitive to pressure, physical pressure, you could absolutely reach positive punishment levels. But for the majority of dogs out there, for you watching this video probably, your dog probably doesn't give a shit about the flat collar, right? They'll probably just choke themselves out on it all day long on the walk. They'll pull into it like nobody's business. They, they're blowing up at someone. You go to correct them. They don't care, right? Like they just don't care. For most dogs, they're so desensitized to the flat collar that the most you could reach is just like moderate levels of negative reinforcement for most dogs, right? Now, if we take this a step up, maybe we have something like a slip lead. Okay, a slip lead. Maybe we got like a, like a rope slip lead, right? Something like that. Okay, well then you might be able to get somewhere like here. Or maybe, for some dogs, over here, 
right? It all depends on the dog. It depends on the competing motivator. It depends on the environment. But maybe you might be able to achieve more levels of, of pressure, right? So now that tool gives you a bit more scope, right? Maybe you have a tool like a choke chain, for example, which is basically a slip lead, it's just metal, right? There, you might be able to reach even higher levels of pressure, right? So that, that tool gives you a bit more scope, right? And you can kind of see where I'm getting at here, right? Now, here's an important point, is how your dog perceives that pressure is dependent on many variables. And I listed some of those variables earlier, but just to recap here, right? You might have noticed that if you're walking your dog, say on a slip lead, for example, right? You may have been doing, let's say you're doing loose leash walking with a slip lead, right? And you may have noticed that around your neighborhood, right, around low distractions, they do pretty good. They do pretty good. Like they're very responsive to the pressure. You can negatively reinforce behaviors very well. You can positively punish behaviors if, you, if necessary, right? And your dog is very like receptive to this type of pressure in this environment. That's the key. But when you go out to new environments, or you up the level of competing motivators, right? You go out to a very busy place, it's new, there's tons of stuff around, tons of smells. You might notice that that same level of pressure that you're using to, for whatever, to negatively reinforce behaviors or to positively punish behaviors, all of a sudden doesn't work anymore, right? Why? Because your dog's tolerance for pressure, your dog's threshold for pressure just increased, right? Their line just went over here now in this new environment. You see what I'm saying? And so having a tool that can, that has a lot of scope is extremely useful when you're trying to create reliability in behaviors. Because the, the worst thing you could do if you're trying to create reliability, right, is you teach a dog that, um, you teach a dog that you have to be reliable around our neighborhood, but around new environments or new situations or high distractions, all of a sudden there is no reliability and you don't have to listen, right? So that's why having a tool that has a lot of scope is very important in achieving our goal, okay? So that's why we use a prong collar, is because it has the most scope out of the other tools, okay? And of course, there are right ways to use a prong collar, there are wrong ways to use a prong collar, and we'll get into those as we go through the training. And in terms of like how to actually negatively reinforce behaviors, how to positively punish behaviors, we get into that in the training program, okay? But for now, I just wanted to explain why we use it instead of other tools, so I hope this makes sense, all right? So that's why we use prong collars. Let's go ahead and check that off the list. So now let's talk about how prong collars work. So when you get your prong collar in the mail or you order it, you pick it up from the store, I want you to take a look at it and just play around with it, right? You'll notice that these end points are actually very blunt. A common misconception is people think that these are sharp, that they're gonna like puncture the skin of the dog, and that's not true. These are very, these are very blunt points, right? You can pull very hard on it, and it's uncomfortable, but it's not painful, right? When you, once you release the pressure, you're not in pain, right? And that's because these are very blunt. So when you get it, take a look at it, right? You'll notice a few different things. You'll notice you have this center plate, right? This is what goes over your dog's throat area. You notice you have all of these individual links. You notice you have these end plates here attached to this martingale chain style thing at the back. This is what your leash attaches to, all right? So there are all these components and I want you to play around with it and get familiar with it, okay? So when you get yours, I want you to practice taking it on and off. These two end plates here that are attached to the chain, these two end plates are attached to links. And these are special links that are different from all of the other links, right? You can see that this link here, right? This link here is different from all of the other ones. And this link is what you use to take the collar on and off, right? So let me show you how to do that real quick. So to take your collar on and off, you're going to locate the end plate, grab that link, and here's what I usually do. I'll slide the link out like this until it's just barely there. And you notice all you have to do is just grab it and pinch. Super easy, all right? Now you just have that link there and then you have your opening and closing link here, okay? Here we go again, just for you to see. You got your link, you just put it in, pinch it in, boom, now it's in, all right? Same with the other side, same deal, okay? You've got your link, kind of pop it out, all you have to do is pinch, boom, right? Pops right out. To put it back in, put it in, pinch, 
boom, now it's back in. And you see how everything's aligned, right? The mistake I see people make is like, they'll do all types of crazy things like the one link is in, like one link is like this way, and it's like, what, what is going on here, right? The, the prongs should go right into where they fit. Boom, just like that, all right? They should all be facing the same direction. It looks very clean, all right? So that's how they work. They essentially, they go on your dog. When your dog is just wearing it normally, it's just resting on their skin, right? It's just, it's non-active. Then when you make pressure, it creates discomfort that disperses the pressure evenly around the dog's neck. So for example, instead of something like a flat collar, where when you make pressure, all of the pressure just boom, right on their throat area, instead of that, or instead of a slip lead where their pressure is wrapped around their neck and it cuts off oxygen to their throat, instead of that, the pressure is just evenly dispersed around their neck onto the blunt prongs around their neck, right? So that's how the pressure works. And then once you release that pressure, it releases, right? You make pressure, it cinches, you release it, it releases, right? So that's how the collar works. All right, so now let's talk about what brand and what size you should buy, all right? So there's really only one brand you should buy, and that brand is Herm Springer, all right? Herm Springer is a company made in Germany that makes the most high quality prong collars, okay? Don't get, don't cheap out. Don't get one of like some collar off Amazon. Don't get some one from Petco, all right? Just don't do it. Order a legit Herm Springer prong collar, all right? And just a warning, don't order these on Amazon. For whatever reason, okay, people are selling fakes on Amazon, all right? And they're just not the same. And you can notice, you can notice the difference, all right? I've ordered a lot of different collars and I'll have a link to one down below from a company that I like that's online that ships everywhere. And I'll just link them down below, okay? Um, you can also get these at like a pet retailer, right? So if you have like a local pet store or something near you, then you can get a Herm Springer from there, right? Just make sure it's actually Herm Springer. Okay, so now that's what brand you should get. The next thing is what size should you buy, okay? So don't follow the size guides on their website or whatever, okay? They're gonna recommend you get the most gigantic collar of all time, all right? Don't do that. Here's my size guide. For dogs under 80 pounds, get a 2.25 millimeter Herm Springer. That's this size. It's the smallest size that they have, okay? And I really, I prefer using the 2.25 whenever I can, just because of the, I just like the way it feels better, right? So the other ones can get a little bit chunky, like you'll see, they're, they're pretty chunky, and I like the small ones better. So there are two variations here, right? Oh, there are a few variations, actually. So the first one and the most common one is the chrome plated collar, right? This is the one you'll see most often, right? It says steel chrome plated. I don't know if you can see that, but it says steel chrome plated. And this is the most common type of collar, right? So if you get, can get your hands on this, that's totally fine, okay? Now, if you wanna take it a step up, if you have access to it, or if you can order these online, then I would recommend getting the stainless steel variation because the stainless steel is just gonna last longer. It's more resilient to rust and it's just higher quality. It'll also, um, if your dog has a nickel allergy, there's nickel in the chrome plated ones. Uh, this one is just stainless steel. So it's better for dogs who have uh, metal allergies, right? Uh, if your dog, also, if your dog has allergies to just everything or if they're, they got a lot of metal allergies going on. They have these Kurrigan ones that are made for those types of dogs, right? They're rose gold, so kind of pretty. They also make um, black stainless steel ones, which are super sexy if you have a black dog. And so that's what you should get if you have a dog that's under 80 pounds, the 2.25 millimeter Herm Springer prong collar. And I'll have links to some down below. Now dogs over 80 pounds, you should get the 3.0 or the 3.2 millimeter Herm Springer, right? And this is what this boy looks like, all right? It's a different, different type of thing, right? This is real chunky, it's real heavy, it's real, it's just, it's just a chunky boy, okay? So I only like using these for dogs who are, you know, real big, beefy dogs, okay? The, the large, extra large type of dogs, all right? So that's what I would recommend using for those types of dogs. Now, if your dog has a thick neck, all right, if you've got like a, you know, you got like a Frenchie, okay, they've got that thick neck, 
around, then you might want to get some additional links, okay? So these come with just a standard amount of links. And you may, if your dog has a thick neck, you may need some additional links. And so I'll have a link to where you can just buy additional links. But it basically just looks like this. They're just some additional links, right? And all you do when you get your collar is you're just gonna, you know, take it apart, right? So it's nice and open. And you're just gonna put those links in and then close it again, right? So how you resize these collar is you just take, take links in and out. That's about it, right? For most dogs, you're gonna be fine with just the links that they provide, but if your dog has a super thick neck, you'll want additional links, okay? So that covers what brand and what size you should buy in terms of collars. All right, so how should your collar fit? How do you get proper fitment? So your collar should fit your dog snug, right? It should be behind the ears and above the throat. Behind the ears, above their throat. So it sits high on your dog's neck, all right? So here's how it should fit. I think this collar might be a perfect fit. Yes, okay, so this collar is a perfect fit on me, all right? You see how, like, how it's sitting on my neck and it's resting there and it's not like, it's not hanging like a necklace and at the same time it's not digging into my skin when I'm not like doing it, when you're not making pressure on it, right? It's just sitting there, it's just resting and that's it. That's how it should fit for your dog, all right? So it should fit snug snug like a watch all right like how does your watch fit when you shake your wrist around and your watch isn't flopping all over the place but at the same time it's not cutting off circulation to your hand right it's just snug it's on there right that's how it should fit okay so if it's too loose go ahead and pop a link out and then try it again if it's too tight put a link in and then tighten it up and just get a feel for it okay and give you a tip if you're like, if you're like, hmm, I don't know if my collar is too tight or too loose, right? When you put it on your dog's neck, you shouldn't be able to, to like, you should be able to like gently just like lift up a prong. Like maybe get, get one finger under there and like you can kind of feel the gap, right? So it shouldn't be like super loose or anything like a flat collar, for example. Like you shouldn't be able to get like your whole hand underneath, underneath the collar when your dog is wearing it, right? It should be pretty snug. Like it just, it just sits on there. It's just resting right on their skin. It's not digging into their skin. It's just resting there, right? And then when you make pressure, now it's activated, okay? So it should fit snug behind the ears, above the throat. If your collar is hanging, if there's like all of this, all of this room and it's like looking like a necklace on your dog, it's way too loose, okay? Most oftentimes, people have their collars too loose, all right? Most of the time, it's too loose, all right? Now, so yeah, there's a little tip for you guys there, right? If, if you're like using the collar and you're walking around doing stuff with your dog and you notice like the collar is like falling down their neck and it's like moving down, like and it's all like twisted up and it's just like rotating around their neck, it's probably too loose. You could probably take out a link, right? Now use common sense here, right? Obviously don't do it if it's like super tight, like choking up on your dog and your dog is just like, holy shit, right? Like don't do that, okay? So some common sense here, but it should fit snug like a watch behind the ears, above the throat. So let me go ahead and show you an example with an actual dog. All right guys, so here we're gonna be introducing the prong collar to our 12 year old senior dog, Fernie here. I got some treats with me and I got the collar. So what I'm gonna do first, just to see if it fits, is I'm just gonna step on his leash so he can't move. And I'm gonna come underneath his head and around. And you can see here how high I am on the dog's head, right? Let me get his, his ears out the way. Um, you can see that I want it fitting high, right behind the ears, above the throat, right? So you can see here is two ears and it's right behind them. And you can see this is too big, right? Far too big. You can see how much extra room that would be, right? I'll go ahead and attach it just so you can see. And you can see, look at that. That's just way too big for him. Okay, so how you want the prong collar to fit is you want it to be snug like a watch. You see my watch right now? If I move it around like this, there's a little bit of room, but it's not flopping around all over the place. It's tight on there, right? It's secure. And at the same time, it's not cutting off circulation to my hands, right? So it's a, it's a snug fit, and that's how you want it. Snug, but not tight. So let's go ahead and take out another couple prongs here. I'm gonna pop one more off on each side, and we'll see how this does. Okay, so 
attach this. Go ahead and take one off on the other side. That way it's even and that base plate can stay in the middle. Okay, so now I've got four popped out in total. And let's go ahead and see how this fits. All right, so I'm gonna slide it underneath his head. Make sure we get his ears out the way. Going high on the neck, behind the ears. And let's see here. So this is how a lot of people would like their prongs to fit, right? Um, because they kind of feel bad when it's tight. Uh, but you can see here that there is just far too much room. I can literally fit like many of my fingers under here, even though I've taken out four prongs and it's just not as tight as it needs to be. If this was on him, uh, we could train with this, we could make it work, but it's not gonna be as effective and it's gonna be dangling around and kind of hanging like a medallion. Okay, so we're gonna take out one more. Okay, so now we've taken out five in total and this should give us the fit that we need uh, for Fernie here, all right? So let's go ahead and put this on him. All right, so one more time. Gonna come high on the head, behind the ears. And there we go, that's a good fit. Okay, let's get his ears out the way so you can see. And it's kind of hard because he has a lot of fur around his, his ear area, his neck area. Uh, but you can see how this fits, right? See, here's his ears. It fits high on the neck, right behind the ears, above the throat. So his flat collar is hanging way down here. And you can see, this is, it's tight, just like my watch, right? There's not a lot of room in between. Uh, it's resting on there comfortably when it's not engaged. But when it does engage, um, you can see that it just contracts nicely over here, right? You can see these chains are freeing, are moving freely. And that's what you want to see, right? Nothing's twisted up, nothing's tangled, everything looks good. You want to check, make sure everything's aligned, and this looks good. So this is a properly fitted prong collar on Fernie here, all right? So we had to take out five links in total for this small dog. And again, guys, he's never had this on, but he seems to be like relatively comfortable. He's kind of shaking around like, oh my gosh, you know, what the heck is this? And before you put this on your dog, you want to make sure you build a positive association with it, right? You show them it, you give them treats, you put it on, you take it off, you give them treats, this whole thing. But for the purposes of this video, I just kind of put it on him just to show you uh, everything that works. So if you zoom in here, uh, you can see on the collar that there are two rings. You got this big ring down here on the bottom, and then on the top you have a small ring. The small ring up top is called the live ring. Okay, the live ring is what you're gonna attach your leash to, right? So that sits on the top and you can see it moves freely like this. It has a swivel on it. So when you pull the leash, the collar contracts. The bottom ring here is called the dead ring, right? So if you attached your leash to both clips, um, then there would be no contracting action, right, with the collar. But we always like using the live ring and we use the dead ring to back up the collar. And I'll show you what this looks like now. So if you have a carabiner, of sorts, right? If you have a carabiner, uh, let's see, where is the carabiner? Is it around here? Uh, let's see here. Let's try to find our pink carabiner somewhere. <laughs> we had one around somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it is right now, but your foot. I'll go ahead and find show your foot. you. <laughs> oh, yep. Here it is. Pink carabiner hiding from it. All right. So this is this is a big carabiner. You don't have to use one this big, obviously. I'll have links to some, uh, but this is just what we had lying around. So how you're gonna do this? is you attach the carabiner to the dead ring, right? Which is the big ring on the bottom of the prong. And then you would attach the carabiner to the flat collar, right? So just like that. And boom, just like that, now the collar is secure. So even if this came out, hopefully it never does, but if it did come out, which they can, uh, your dog is secure, right? The leash disconnects, the collar falls apart or whatever, and boom, you've got a backup, right? Your leash is connected to this flat collar through the carabiner. So you're, you'd be good to go. All right. So that's how you back up the collar. Um, and that's what we use the dead ring for. But for the majority of the time, uh, the leash is just going to be connected to the live ring, the collar, which is the top small one. All right. So that's how we fit the prong collar properly. Uh, even on a senior dog just like this, right? You want it nice and snug, like a watch, right behind their ears, above their throat. So now let's talk about the preconditioning phase for the collar. And this isn't required per se for every dog, but you know, it's, it's good to do this just in case, because for some dogs, this is very beneficial. Some dogs are very skeptical or suspicious of new things 
coming on to them, right? Some of you might be able to relate to this, right? You, you put something new on your dog and your dog is like, oh gosh, it's the end of the world, right? I can't move and all this stuff, right? So some dogs are very sensitive to this, other dogs aren't, but doing this, it, it'll never hurt anyone, okay? So preconditioning, how do you do it? Preconditioning, in simple terms, all you're doing is you're building or creating a positive association with the prong collar, all right? Miles, what is a positive association? A positive association is when you attach good things, good outcomes to some stimulus, right? So let me give you an example of positive associations your dog probably has, okay? Let's say um, you, you, leave, you leave them at home while you're at work, right? When you pull up in your driveway and your dog hears the garage door opening and they hear, you know, all of that, they hear your car coming in, then they're probably getting excited, right? They're like, oh my gosh, my people are home, right? Why? Because that stimulus of those, those sounds, those noises have led in the past to that reinforcement event, which is you coming home and interacting with them and all of that stuff, right? So that stimulus in your dog's mind they have a positive association with that, okay? Another example, let's say um, you are, uh, for some dogs, when you grab the leash, like when you grab the leash and you're about to go on a walk, right when you grab the leash, your dog starts to get all excited. Ooh, right, I'm excited, I'm excited. Why? Because your dog has learned that when you do this thing, when this stimulus happens, when you grab the leash in this way, it means you're going out for a walk, you're gonna go play together and all that stuff, right? So your dog has a positive association with that stimulus. Um, when you put on your treat pouch, your dog gets all excited, right? Cause they're like, oh, okay, now we're gonna work and I'm gonna get these fancy treats, all of that stuff, right? Positive associations. So with the prong collar, what we can do is we can create a positive association. How do we do that, right? All we have to do is very simple. We have to carefully reward certain behaviors that we're looking for, right? So in the beginning, we might just present this to the dog. When they go and engage with it, maybe their nose touches it, chup, reward with food, right? And then they go away, they're like, whoa, that was weird. And then they do it again. They engage with it, chup, reward. There we go, right? We shake it a little bit. Kind of a strange noise, right? The dog is like, oh, what is that? They engage with it, chup, reward, right? And you can see how this kind of plays out. We open it a little bit. We might put it underneath their neck. Chup, reward. We might put it up to their ear. Chup, reward, right? And now all of a sudden your dog is learning what? That this collar means good things. Means good things are going to happen, okay? So that's building a positive association. And you can just do this incrementally, right? Put it on your dog. You can even, right, once you build up to it, you can even put this around your dog's neck. Chup, and then reward, right? Take it off, put it on. Chup, reward, right? And your dog starts to learn that, oh, this collar leads to good things, right? Whenever I hear this collar, whenever I hear this sound, whenever I see it, good things are about to happen, right? So that's how you build a positive association with the prong collar. Now let me show you an example with an actual dog. Good boy, buddy. Good boy. Good. All right, he likes this. All right, so trip is the marker, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and whenever he hears that, he knows he's getting paid with food. Chip. The reason why I'm doing this and taking it slow is because this is weird. It's metal and it's like loud. And it's just weird. So we have to make sure that you know he's cool with it. Chip. Good boy, good boy, buddy. Chip. Good. Good boy, very good boy. And here I'm gonna kind of pretend to put it on, take it off. Chip. 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 
Good boy. That's a good boy. Chup. Good. Good job. Good. <laughs> good. Chup. Good. Boy. Chup. Chup. Good. Good boy, buddy. All right. Now we'll go ahead and put it on. <clears throat> and we'll see if this fits or not. You want to go ahead and grab his harness, just like right here. <laughs> just like grab it right here, just so he doesn't move. Okay. Chup. Good. And then I'm going to put it on and see if it's the right size, and then we'll adjust from there. Chup. Good. I think the size will work. Okay. What's that? Uh, which one? The flat collar. Oh, the flat collar? Yeah. Oh, the flat collar is just fine. It can, he can, he can keep it on. Chup. Good boy. Good job. Good job. Yeah. All right. So now that we've covered the preconditioning phase, now let's talk about the active conditioning phase. This is where you actually put the collar on the dog and you start using it. All right. So you're going to put this on your dog. At this point, you should already have good fitment. Your dog should already have a positive association with the collar. Now what you're going to do is you're going to start the active conditioning process. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to go out into a low distraction environment, maybe your driveway, maybe an empty familiar park, maybe a, a parking garage if you live in an apartment, right? Some, some low distraction area where there's no competing motivators around. All right. So what you're going to do here is you're going to have the prong collar on the dog. You're going to have the leash attached to the prong collar, of course, and you're going to have some food with you. And what you're going to do is you're going to teach the dog how to turn off this pressure productively, all right? You're going to teach them how to turn it off. You're going to teach them how to win. All right. This is going to become a little bit of a game. All right. So what you're going to do is with your dog, you're going to make directional pressure on the leash directional. All right. So you're going to give them a direction. If your dog is facing that way, you might make directional pressure with the leash this way. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're just going to make very, very light pressure on the leash. Emphasis on light. Okay. Don't be dragging your dog around. Don't be pulling them in a direction. I just want you to, to, to activate that collar just barely, just barely, gently. Okay. Very gentle. Your dog feels it. They perceive it. They feel it. And you're going to let them decide what to do. Okay. For most dogs, what they're going to do, dogs have something in them called opposition reflex. So when they feel pressure one way, their instinct is just to go the opposite direction. Opposition reflex is to brace against the pressure, right? If someone came up behind you and it was slowly pushing you forward, your instinct is to lean backwards, is to fight that pressure, right? That's your, that's opposition reflex. For your dogs, when they feel that pressure on the leash, their instinct is to go the other way, okay? So what we need to do is we need to teach them the opposite, how to turn off the pressure, how to win, all right? So when you're making that light, gentle pressure on the leash, just wait, let your dog feel it, let them think. And what you'll see is if you hold out long enough, right? If your dog just stands there, maybe they're just standing. Maybe you make a little bit more pressure, just a little bit, a little bit more pressure towards you. What you'll notice at some point is your dog will give into it, right? They'll go from bracing against it, their feet are planted, and then they give into it. And right when they give into it like that, right? They feel the pressure, they feel it, they feel it is coming that way. They're going to give into it. That's where you chup, 
and then you release the pressure and you reward with food, right? You're teaching the dog that when they feel that pressure, the solution to it is to give into it, give into the pressure, right? That's how they obtain the reward. That's how the pressure turns off. That's how they win, right? And you can make this pretty fun. You can make this exciting. You can make quick pressure. They give into it. Yeah, good boy, buddy, right? And then you reward. And so that's the active conditioning. It's directional pressure on the leash, very light. Then you release, mark, and reward with food. Okay, so now let me go ahead and show you some examples with real dogs. All right, guys, so we're gonna begin the prong collar conditioning phase with Fernie here. Fernie, 12 month, 12 year old senior dog. You can see he's on the flat collar right now. He's got no problem pulling into this hard. You know, he's been pulling into this for most of his life. And so the reason why we wanna switch from the prong collar is because it's something new, okay? It's gonna be very difficult to train him on the flat collar because he's so desensitized to the pressure. So we're gonna switch him to something new, right? something unfamiliar that he's not used to. You can see how comfortable he is with this, right? It doesn't even face him one bit. So we're gonna go ahead and start the prong collar conditioning phase with Fernie here, and I'll walk you through the entire step, the entire step-by-step -step process. So we already started the fitment inside and all that. So now we're gonna go ahead and switch him over to the live ring. And then we're gonna go ahead and begin the training. So I have some treats with me if he takes that. If he doesn't, not a big deal. I'll show you what to do if your dog doesn't take treats. All right, so let's go ahead and switch this over. And the live ring, just by the way guys, is the top ring, right? It's the top small ring right on the collar. So this small one right here with the swivel, that's the one you're gonna attach yourself to, right? Everything's good, chains are flowing good, uh, nothing's tangled up. So now he's on the collar, I'm gonna let him know what he has on. You feel that buddy? Yeah, yeah, you feel that? Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce him to the concept of releasing the pressure. So dogs have this thing built into them, guys, all animals do, called opposition reflex. So when he feels pressure, his instinct is to brace into it, right? Brace, fight against it. It's the same with you, right? If I came up behind you and like pushed you, tried to push you forward, your instinct is just kind of brace back into it, right? It's very unnatural for an animal to just give into the pressure. So we have to teach him how to do that. Okay, so here, He's got the collar on. I got treats ready right here, and I'm gonna apply a little bit of pressure. Good. Good, good boy. Good job, buddy. Okay, he hasn't really made a good one yet, so I'm gonna wait here. Good, good boy. Good, good job, buddy. Okay, so. He may or may not take treats outside. I don't know. He's not the craziest food drive dog. He kind of just, he just kind of half laps at it, you know? So here I'm gonna apply some pressure. Good boy, good job. And that's all I wanna see. I wanna see that when I apply steady pressure on the leash, and it's light guys, I'm not pulling the dog in any way. I'm not popping the dog of any sort. I'm just applying gentle pressure directionally. And once the dog gives into the pressure, I'm marking and I'm rewarding, okay? Okay. And here I'll just kind of move around a little bit. For any, let him drift away and do his thing. Here I'll apply pressure. Good boy, good job, buddy. Good, good job. Okay. All right, so we're just moving him around, guys. And I'm, we're getting him in the habit. We're teaching him how to turn off the pressure. Good boy, good job, good. Pressure, Chip. good, good boy. All right, so we're just conditioning it, right guys? We're changing his perception of the pressure. In the past, right, he feels the pressure and his instinct is to fight against it, to get whatever he wants to get. And now we're teaching him the opposite, that if you give into the pressure, you get something good, all right? You get some string cheese. Chip. Good boy, good job. And again, if we were doing this on a flat collar, it'd be extremely difficult because he's 12 years old and he's super desensitized to the flat collar, right? The prong collar gives you leverage. Chip. Good. Good boy. Okay. And now let's talk about what you would do if your dog didn't take treats. Okay. So imagine you're outside and you're doing the same exact thing where you have a low food drive dog, doesn't take treats. No big deal. What you're going to do is just apply pressure. Good boy, good job, buddy. And then you can praise the dog once they give into it, okay? Pressure. Good, good. 
good good job buddy and you can even give the dog some praise in between right some affection and whatever okay so that's what you would do if you had a low food drive dog who wasn't taking treats during the conditioning phase not a big deal right just keep moving them around get them in the habit of turning off the pressure what you want to see is that when you apply pressure on the leash the dog doesn't have an aversion to the pressure right they deal with it in a productive way because remember when you apply pressure, you're creating stress. And so if your dog has never learned or been exposed to stress in controlled environments, they might have a complete panic attack, right? And I'll show you clips of dogs who have had that in the conditioning phase. Um, but here, let's just move them around a little bit more. Good. Chip. Good boy. Good job. Very good. All right, and that's it guys. It's really that simple. You just wanna get out and apply a controlled amount of pressure and then you wanna see that the dog, good boy, good job, has a productive response to the pressure, meaning they give right into it and come towards your direction. Okay, so that's what you wanna see in the prong collar conditioning. All right guys, now we're gonna start the conditioning phase with the collar. Um, we just clipped it on, he's never felt it before, so it's gonna be very strange for him. So we just wanna make sure he knows the gear he has on right now, right? We don't want him to kind of just freak out and smack the end of the leash, All right? So we just wanna teach him what that means. And right off the bat, I'm gonna to apply pressure and then teach him how to turn it off. Good boy. Good boy. All right, so I don't want him to fail right now. I just want to apply pressure. If he fights it like this, do not give in to it. Pressure. Good boy. When he makes that decision to turn and give in to it, reward that. Pressure. Good boy. Hey there, he's still kind of throwing a fit, but at least he gave in to it. Good, all right, there you saw he made that decision. Choke on the cheese, Chip. good, all right. So you're just applying steady pressure, it's not hard, you're not pulling the leash, you're just applying the pressure and then waiting until the dog responds in a productive way. So in the beginning when I clipped on the, when I clipped on the collar and applied the first pressure. Chip. Good, good, all right. So pressure creates stress. And this dog does not know how to cope with stress productively. So you saw him like flailing around and kind of freaking it out and you know, having a panic attack essentially because he doesn't know how to cope with stress. Chip. And so right now what we're doing is we're teaching him how to cope with stress in a productive way. Chip. This does a lot of things. Want to add structure. Chip. Good. It builds his confidence. It builds his confidence in you, Chip. and it builds obligation in the training. Chip. Good. Good boy. That's a good boy. All right, because now what we're teaching him how to do is we're teaching him how to be a winner. Okay, so we're creating this stress. Chip. Good. And he figures out how to win the game. Good boy. Good boy, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's jumping too. We won't worry about that right now. We'll fix that later. Good. Chip. Good. Chip. Good. Chip. Good. All right, so we're just working him around here. Just, we're just still in the conditioning phase, guys. Right, we're just teaching him how to turn off the pressure. When he feels it, chip, good. I want him to come right to me. This is important to teach before we start loose leash walking because dogs, all animals really, chip, have an opposition reflex. So if I came up to you and tried to push you in the back, you would lean backwards, right? You would resist the pressure. Chip, good. Dogs are the same way. If you pull back on the leash, their natural reflex is to pull harder, right? To fight that pressure. So we have to teach him the opposite. We need to teach him that chip. if he gives into the pressure, he gets rewarded. Chip. 
Good. Just walking them around. Pressure. Good. Teach them how to be a winner. Good boy. Good. Good job, buddy. That's my good boy. That's a good boy. Now, if your dog isn't food motivated, you would use praise. Good. Good boy. All right, I didn't use food that time. I'll show it to you again. Good. Good boy, buddy. Good job. Yeah, good job, buddy. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. Yes, right? So, yeah, good job. So there, I didn't want to correct him because I didn't want to apply too much pressure too soon. Yeah, that's my good boy. Good job, buddy. All right, so now at this point, I would consider this dog conditioned because when he feels the pressure, he gives into it. And so now what I have to do is I have to condition her to this, okay? So I have to teach her what it means and how to turn it off and all that, okay? I can't just put it on and start like training with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna apply a little bit of pressure and she's gonna be like, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do. And she's gonna kind of fight it, right? Mm -hmm. So just wait, I'm gonna maintain the pressure and she's gonna freak out and that's okay. And right now what's important is I can't give in to this because if I do, she's gonna learn that when she feels pressure, all she has to do is freak out and the pressure turns off, okay? So right now the pressure is creating stress. That dog right there is stress. She doesn't know how to cope with stress. So we have to teach her how to cope with stress in the training, okay? So right here, I'm just applying pressure and she's fighting it. It's okay, it's okay, don't give in. And you're gonna take the leash after. She might do the same thing to you, all right? Chip. Good. Good girl, right? That's very, very, very important um, that you don't give into it in that moment. It's kind of like, a, I don't know, if you had a, a kid and you told them to do something, go clean your room and they threw a tantrum. Mm -hmm. If you give into it, it's gonna happen every single time, right? And you accidentally taught your dog the way to release the pressure is to freak out and do all that, okay? So she's acting like she's dying and she's, you know, freaking out about it, but she'll be just fine. She'll be just fine. Chip. Good. And once she learns how, like, oh, I get it. I just have to come towards you, chip, and the pressure turns off, and I get paid. Like, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's a no-brainer, you know? Chip. Good. So you see how light that was, right? I'm applying, like, barely any pressure. I'm not pulling her. I'm not, like, popping it. Just barely any pressure, okay? Chip. Good. Right when she gives into it, I'm chirping and then rewarding, all right? So here she's coming towards you. I'm going to apply light pressure. Chip. Good. See how light that is? Good girl. Ready? Light pressure. Chip. Good. Good girl. Wow. Wow. Chip. Wow. Good girl. Okay. So I'm going to apply light pressure. Good. That's a good girl. Good. Okay. And light pressure. Chip. Wow. You see how light that is? And she's responding to it, right? This is what we want. Chip. Good girl. Okay. So what I'm looking for right now is just looking that she understands the pressure. She knows how to turn it off. Okay. And what I should be able to do is apply barely any pressure like this and she just turns and comes towards it, okay? So this tells me she has a productive response to it. She gets it. She's no longer like trying to fight it and freak out and have a panic attack, okay? And this, this does a couple things. In the practical terms, now she understands the collar, we can start training with it. But in the macro, right, in the, the meta skills that we're trying to accomplish here is we're teaching her how to cope with stress and that builds her confidence. That builds her confidence in you too. Because now when she's encountered stress in the environment and all that, she already has, like, she's already dealt with it. We've put stress on her in the training. Okay, so I'll wait until she kind of checks out a little bit. Chip. Good. Good girl. Very good. Light pressure. Chip. 
good. Wow. What a good girl. What a good girl. Good. That's such a good girl. All right, so now that we've covered the entire plan and we've covered the whole video. Now, hopefully at this point, you understand exactly what you need to do to go out and start using the prong collar with your dog and in the training, all right? Just a warning here. Just because you condition your dog to the prong collar doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden now trained. It just means that now you can use this tool in your training. Now you can use this tool to train loose leash walking. You can use this tool to train the recall, but this doesn't mean that the caller does the training for you, right? It doesn't mean that now all of a sudden you can go out and your dog just walks on a loose leash magically. Like you still have to train loose leash walking. You still have to train the recall, train the healing. The caller isn't just this magical device that does all the training for you, right? You still have to do the training, all right? So that's it for this video. Hopefully this was helpful.